Welcome to the Quantum Biology Collective Podcast, where we break down the practical strategies of this emerging science, starting with healthy light habits and going wherever the quantum superhighway takes us. This is your host, executive and life coach, Meredith Oak, with a quick reminder that podcasts are conversations, not consultations, and definitely not medical advice. We're here for informational purposes only. To follow up with our amazing guests, please do check out the show notes and to stay in the loop with the QBC podcast, join our email list, also linked in the show notes. Most people, when they start to learn how important circadian rhythms are to their overall health, start to make a few small changes and gradually over time, maybe really optimize their light environment. That was certainly my journey. Then you have people like our guest today, Stephen Lubka. Stephen has structured his entire life around being outside as much as possible every single day, even though he has a pretty demanding day job. He is a fierce proponent of a circadian optimized lifestyle, and he is on social media all the time uh, touting the benefits of sun maxing, uh, a term I think he may have coined. I don't know, but it's a good one, right? Sun maxing. Uh, He's also really super smart and has become a citizen researcher in the area of the benefits of sunlight and also skin cancer research. So the more time that we devote to being outside, the more important it is to really understand the nuances of what the research says about the link between the sun and skin cancer. And Stephen lays this out for us very clearly and very methodically. So this is a really good one to truly like sort of understand what that research is really saying, where we need to be careful uh, with our sun exposure and where the research has, you know, kind of overstated the risk. Uh, to put it mildly. Uh, And of course, when it comes to circadian optimization, don't forget the easiest and simplest way to make sure that you are not uh, exposing your eyeballs to the wrong kind of light at night is to wear blue blocking glasses. I went into a bit of detail on last week's episode about the orange blue blockers, how they are for nighttime only. Uh, And today I'm gonna mention that you can also get daytime blue blockers Now the daytime blue blocking lenses should not be orange. As you can see, I'm wearing a pair here, right? And they're kind of clear, but they do cut out some of the harsher light that's coming off of laptops and iPhones and things that we stare at all day long. So we're delighted to be working with our brand partner, Bond Charge, a holistic and wellness company. They have been making really cute, high quality blue blockers since 2018. And they have very kindly offered a promotion to our listeners. You get 15% off any of their products when you put the code QBC in their checkout. There is a link in the show notes to go visit their website. And I highly encourage you to do that. And don't forget to put in the QBC code when you check out. Okay, here is my interview with Steve Lubka. It's really fun. And he and a partner have actually made a really great YouTube video as well about some of the topics that we cover, which I will also link to in the show notes. So have fun and get some sun. All right, Steve Lubka, welcome to the Quantum Biology Collective Podcast. I'm very excited to talk to you about all the things. I'm so happy to be here. I'm really thrilled for this. Thank you for having me on. Okay. My pleasure. So we're going to cover, well, I won't say because who knows, but we're going to start with the sun. And if you could just sort of give a little bit of a background, you, you know, you have a a job in the new economy, in the new world, (laughs) and you are what, what I, uh, what the Twitter, what the Twitter calls a sun maxer. So tell us about that. Tell us how you, what that means and how you've set your life up. Yeah, so I am the uh, I'm the head of private clients for uh, a company called Swan Bitcoin, and so we're actually I run a like a concierge investing service for higher net worth investors. Uh, so we're a remote organization, uh, been growing rapidly over the last three and four years. Um, we work with uh, we work with clients to help them navigate Bitcoin, manage investments, all, all sorts of things. Like we can get into that later if you want to. Uh, but I've been into, and I'm well known on Twitter for kind of being the sunlight Bitcoin guy uh, in that kind of world. Um, and I've actually been into sunlight 
as a kind of health practice, as a lifestyle practice since probably like 2015. So for, for quite a while. Um, and it's, you know, I'm fortunate, you know, via my work, and we were just talking about this uh, before we turned the camera on of just that for, for people that are struggling and that are new to this, that are, tr they, they, they hear this information that you talk about so much on, on this podcast and they want to implement some of these circadian lifestyle and health interventions. Like I think the biggest problem so many people face is their job, right? Like they, most people are just forced to be inside for 40 hours or more a week. Um, and you know, I've, you know, I've been fortunate, right. I've, I've done remote work for a while and we are a remote organization and great company culture. So it's allowed me to kind of live a different lifestyle. Um, and I think that's a big unlock for most people, but, um, you know, I've been just a huge proponent, uh, experientially, like, you know, I've, 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 you know, read probably a lot of the same stuff that many of your listeners have. Uh, but just for me, ultimately the, um, the line is just, it has been so experientially real, right? So you can read all the studies you want, but in my experience, when you implement these things, it is just, it turbocharges your vitality. And to me, that's enough for, to reorganize my whole life around it. Amazing. Yeah, it does. It's, it's, I think people are often surprised how quickly aligning your circadian rhythms will have a positive effect on like every facet of your existence, basically. Absolutely. So tell us what that looks like for you. So you've like found a job where you're able to have control over your environment most of the time. So uh, what is a, a fully circadian optimized day look like for you? Yeah. So, you know, I think it's so much simpler than most people maybe might make it out to be like, the science goes really deep. It's really detailed. But at the end of the day, wake up with the sun, go outside immediately, see it via your eyes without any sort of glass or plastic between your eyes and the sun, get some light on your skin, get that early morning sun. And, you know, I mean, for me, like I'm outside almost all day. I'm a big walker. I walk over 10 miles a day. So I, I'm out. I'm outside most of the day, either like I'm undercover now, but you know, I'm outside, I'm in natural light or, you know, outside directly in the sun. But I mean, even if you can't do that, you know, spend 30 minutes in the morning, take three or four sun breaks during the day, go outside for 10 minutes. It isn't that complicated. Your body needs those signals. It needs sunlight. Obviously there's, it's a spectrum from, you know, okay to ideal right but you're you're accruing benefits the further you move along the spectrum and then the other main thing is just you're, you're going to avoid artificial light at night now this doesn't mean you have to sit in the dark it you know you can get really good quality low red lights that 99 percent don't disrupt the systems that artificial light does and you know put a red i'm, I'm like I use my phone at night, you know, I'm, I'm, I have a job, like, like I have a, you know, kind of high paced job and like, I can't just turn everything off, but you put a red filter on it. You put a red filter on the screen, on your phone. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect, but is it 99% better than otherwise? Like, yes. And I mean, that's the bulk of it, right? You can get into like meal timing and like different things. And I'm not saying there isn't value there, but for the average person that hasn't made this leap, See the sun when you wake up, see the sun throughout the day, use red light at night. That's 80% of it. And you will feel the difference. Yes, I love it. And thanks for making it so simple and straightforward. And in your words, um, what are what are the benefits of doing that? Like yeah. what are we what are we avoiding in the future by doing that? And what are we, what are we getting right now? So I love to focus on like the the present uh experiential benefits a lot because you can have a long conversation about lower cancer rates lower diabetes rates lower ms lower neurological illnesses lower obesity better insulin like all of these things right there's this long tail of health outcomes and that's wonderful and that's great um and for some percentage of the population 
maybe they can be motivated into making a lifestyle change based purely on percentages in the future. Good for you. That's awesome. Uh, I think most people aren't like that. And most people, you can, you know, I mean, walking 17,000 steps a day is uh, better for you than smoking is bad for you. It has a greater reduction in all-cause mortality than smoking increases it. Do most people walk 17,000 steps a day when they hear that? No, they don't. Like, um, yeah. So there's this kind of long view, um, but I like to focus on kind of the short term. And for me, what I've noticed over the years is that when I live my life in this way, when I get a lot of sunlight, I just simply feel, I feel more vital. I feel more driven. I feel more energy. I feel like more solid and robust. Like I can, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just more capable of tackling my life, the things I need to do. Uh, my recovery is better from, you know, athletic stuff. I sleep better. I have lower, better stress management, lower anxiety. And I mean, I'm just happier. Like I'm, I, I've, 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 I've made this kind of argument a couple times on a few podcasts that, um, I actually believe like happiness is literally just a function of sunlight. And I like to distinguish happiness, which I consider like a mood state from like purpose or meaning or life satisfaction. Those are different concepts, right? I'm not saying just getting sun fulfills all of your psychological needs. But if we define happiness as being in a happy mood or not a happy mood, I think that that equation sunlights the primary input. And when I get a lot of sun, I'm in a great mood. And if I don't, it's not as good. And I've seen this play out for close to a decade where when my light environment gets interrupted, either due to travel or work or something or it like rains for two weeks, or it's like super cold, I'm stuck inside, whatever. Um, I'm a different person, right? Like I'm a different person. It, and it's led me to just feel that who we are and what parts of ourselves come out and are expressed, you can't separate that from your light environment. Like there's a lot of other factors you can't separate it from either. But um I experience myself to be a different person. Um, yeah. And it has been one of the most profoundly impactful variables on my life. So, you know, if you can be motivated by like the long term health view, that's awesome. But you don't need to be. And it's this is one of these wonderful things where you don't need to do this arcane thing for months to maybe see results on some blood test. You can just do it for like four days. Yeah. And just notice the difference. Like this isn't hard. Yeah, it happens really quickly. And yeah. to your point about the mood state, that has been made so clear to me. So I'm in New York State. Yeah. And we're just coming into spring. So we're in that time of year where it's like, it's like, it's been gray, it's been cold, it's been this. And then the sun will come out for a few days. And the mood of Everybody, everyone like in our entire household, everyone you see outside, it's like it's lifted You're immediately yeah. just by having the, the sunlight come down on our faces. <laughs> by choosing to live inside, you are experiencing permanent seasonal affective disorder is the way yes. I view it. Like you are literally choosing to live in winter all the time. It is a respectfully and and this was me once upon a time too right so like i get it this isn't an insult but it is an insane decision it is an insane <laughs> decision you do not have choice here you do not have autonomy here you will be impacted by this you either live inside and it's fucking december all the time and you have like permanent seasonal affective disorder even if you say steven i feel kind of okay okay but what percentage of 100% of your personal okay do you feel? You're accepting easily a double digit reduction in well being. If you feel okay, fine. You could feel 30% better all the time. Or for many people, the number is probably much larger than that. Yes. But 
it's and we have lowered our standard of what okay feels like exactly right every time i implement a new level of this i'm like Oh, I thought it felt okay, but now I didn't know I could feel like this, right? Like we forget what it feels like to feel mostly good. Yeah. And that's such a key point, right? And I think a metaphor for this is, have you ever been in a room and there's a smell in the room? After five minutes, you stop smelling it. After 10 minutes, you barely even notice it's there. You have a, you have adapted. You've just like this sort of uh, something like a, like similar to like hedonic adaptation, right? The smell's gone. It's the same thing with like low grade suffering. Like you just adapt to feeling kind of shitty all the time and you lose any sort of reference point that that's even going on. So like you can tell me like, hey, well, I mean, I feel okay in my spending 80 hours out of the week inside. And I don't think you're lying to me. I don't think you're like telling me an untruth, but I don't think you remember what it feels like to really feel alive, to really feel vibrant. Uh, And like, that's our birthright, right? It's, it's not this like esoteric thing. Your system, when it's working properly, it gives you that. And you can't extract, you can't separate your body from your mind and your body and mind from your environment. These things are not separate. They're not these like independent things. Like, and you know, I mean, it's almost a philosophical assumption in modern society. People think they're just their, they're just their mind, and they're it's isolated and it's independent, yeah. and they're just walking around as a thought form. And it deeply influenced by your biology, by your physiology, and your physiology is deeply dependent on your environment, on light, on all of these things. So like, yeah. And we think of ourselves as separate from nature. Oh, I should go and visit nature for a few minutes each day. When in reality, we are a part of nature. It's not like the animals belong out in nature and then we visit it. It's like, we're, we're part of that ecosystem and we're separating ourselves from it by the way we live. Which I'm not, you know, I'm not saying I wish I could go live in the forest. I don't. (laughs) I like I like my house. However, it's it's to your point, like it's a mindset thing, right? Like it's not. So if I if I structure my life to spend as much time, you don't have to as where I'm meant to be. Yeah, you don't have to get malaria, but you need to see the sun. So sorry to interrupt. (laughs) Yeah. No, exactly. So and it's funny, as I said that there's, uh, we live next to the forest preserve and of, of our town and, uh, just a five minute walk down the trail. There's actually a little, a little, uh, area called hermit's grave. And yeah. it's a guy, it was about 150 years ago. He decided he'd had enough of city life or village life. And he moved to the forest and he dug his own grave in the forest and would sleep in it every night so that when, because he could tell his time was ending <laughs> and wow. his grave is still there. It's called Hermit's Graves. It just reminded me of talking about returning to nature. So we don't need to do that. No, 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 no. It's But like- we do need to understand we're meant to be outside most of the time. So when we're not, we'll pay a price. Some things you can change and some things you can't. You need to, it's, it's not true that you need to just fatalistically accept the natural state in every conceivable way. Like if we did that, we'd all be dying of an infection, like all the time and diseases and starving and like, whatever, maybe not starving, like hunter gatherers weren't generally starving, but you know, there are certain essential improvements as well as like the arc of human creativity. Right. I think, I think. You know, for all the flaws that technology has had, I think it's beautiful and amazing. We're talking right now via these remote devices. It's incredible, right? Like, you don't have to fatalistically accept nature. But it's also not true that you can just totally ignore everything and just like tabula rasa blank slate construct your own definition of what it means to be human in every conceivable way. Like, no, I'm sorry. There are certain dependencies and our job is to figure out which ones those are. And light environment is, is the big one is the big one. 
um, you don't have a lot of push or pull there. And an example I like to give on this one, because, you know, in the modern world, right, we've had this uptick of so many kind of chronic health conditions, but also like diseases that people used to not get. Like we stopped getting a lot of the common diseases, but then we started getting all of these relatively rare diseases that were relatively unheard of. And the whole health world is like trying to find the smoking gun. It's our diet. It's our chemicals. It's microplastics. It's we're sedentary. We're not exercising. We're eating too much. It's seed oils. It's blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, and I'm not saying there's no like all of those things are true. Right. And there it's a non zero impact from those things. But what I've contemplated this and it just makes sense to me. And like this isn't an empirical conclusion. This is a logical deduction. Um, I can look at human populations throughout the long arc of history who ate all sorts of different things, who were exposed to all sorts of bad toxins, bacteria, diseases, who had varying activity levels from very sedentary scribes and merchants and kings to very active. Like, you know, there are hunter gatherers that eat almost nothing but carbs. There's hunter gatherers that don't eat vegetables. There's people that are exposed have chronic, you know, hereditary levels of certain, right? These things all change. They're very variable. We've thrived in many of these environments. But do you want to know what's never changed? There's one thing that changed permanently at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution that has absolutely no historical comparison, and that is artificial lighting. There literally was zero. There is no such thing besides a slight level of reflection from the moon of blue light at night in nature, and that's minuscule. Um, you have this. And so it's not just that, like, I'm saying, like, oh, like light bulbs are causing all this. It's two things. One, People are exposed to artificial light at night, which has a, a host of uh, negative health outcomes. But because we have now illuminated the indoors and electrified the indoors and air conditioned the indoors, people stayed inside. So it was dual. You weren't outside and you were now inside with a, with a dysfunctional light cue. And so, you know, I can't prove that's like the smoking gun here, but it's the one thing that has zero historical comparison while all of these other factors have varied across populations across history. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that as I interviewed um, a guy called Dr. Martin Moore Ede, and he was on the team at Harvard that um, yeah. discovered the superchiasmatic nucleus, which actually proved how important circadian rhythms are to humans before that people didn't think much of it. And uh, he came to that same conclusion. Yeah. He sees he sees artificial light at night as the primal, primary cause of yep. all kinds of uh, epidemics that we're seeing. Not that they're not multifactorial, sure. but sure. the circadian disruption and to your and you know as you were saying it in two in two ways. It's like we've uh, increased the toxic light and minimized the healthy light. Like we've exactly. completely, like we've gone in the wrong direction on both sides of the coin. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, yeah, like exercise, don't eat Cheetos, like, you know, don't like pop 30 different pharmaceutical medications every day. Yes, those things have an impact, especially across populations. But I think there is a really, I think it's worth highlighting the light role one, because I really do think it's very central, and two, because to this day, it is really not well understood or talked about. Yes. Everyone it's... knows you should work out. Yes, exactly. I've been like, oh, you tell me an exercise, and it's like, but yes. And especially as the screens have proliferated over the past 10 years, the light bulbs have become brighter. You know, every child is now in front of a screen a big chunk of the day and often a big chunk of the evening. Yeah. Uh, so what we, what we understand about circadian rhythms is becoming every, every day that passes, it's more and more important that people understand that we cannot be healthy if we don't regulate our circadian rhythm. Like it doesn't matter what else we do. Yeah. I think it's like 50% of the genes in your body have a circadian component. Mm -hmm. Like it impacts everything. It, you, you can't, it just throws the system into organizational chaos when that is completely out of whack. Um, and it also, like we talked about this before, it, it also 
confounds deeply the research on so many things. Like so many people avoid the sun because, oh, like the skin cancer story, which is not, it's not baseless. I, I, I wouldn't say that there's like zero effect of the sun on, on skin cancer. It's a very nuanced topic, right? It, you see more of effect on the relatively minor ones. You see actually a reduction on the major ones. You're more likely to survive it if you get more sun. You're more likely to die from it if you get less sun. Very nuanced discussion. But even all that research that I'm basing everything I just said on, it's confounded by the fact that no one is controlling for circadian rhythm in these studies. It's just a general population that is circadian misaligned. Some of these people might work in an office for 60 hours a week and then go surfing on the weekend. Yeah, that, that's not good. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, you're, you're sending your body all sorts of confusing signals. And so like, it just, it confounds all the data. Now that doesn't mean everything I think is right and all of the established conclusions are wrong, but it does mean that we don't really have a clear picture until we control for these mechanisms that it is highly credible impact these disease pathologies. Yeah. And what's, what I find super interesting is that every time well, I shouldn't say every time, I don't know every time, but many times the studies, when they do take into account a person's sun exposure, the all-cause mortality for the people who spend more time outside goes down. Oh, absolutely. Right? So in the studies you just talked about, this, even if you get skin cancer, if you spend more time outside, yeah. you're more likely to survive yep. it. And then the Swedish study where it's like, you're more likely to live longer. And there's a new one that just came out last year. I think it might've been in the UK. That, that had a very similar finding to yeah. the Swedish study, which is basically like the more time you spend outside, the longer you're going to live. It seems and that's to without be even... controlling for circadian rhythm. Like if yeah, you that's were just to... time outside. It would be even more. Yeah. Okay. Like... So we're talking, so, um, so we're talking about how important this is and how, you know, it's so it's not understood very well. And we have these little niche podcasts and, I have like this amazing audience. I love them so much. They're just um, so into it, uh, but it needs to get out farther. So let's talk about the project that you just worked on um, with a filmmaker uh, called Max DeMarco, I believe. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So the two of you got together and made this very fun to watch documentary. It's about 15 minutes long and you cover... Well, just sort of just tell, give us a snapshot of what this is, because I would love for everyone to go out and find this. We'll put it in the show notes and like share it with everybody who doesn't listen to podcasts like this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So so Max is a friend of mine. He's a filmmaker. He's a he's a Bitcoiner. So he's done a lot of Bitcoin documentaries and then later health documentaries on a variety of uh, he's a guy that likes to try different things. And so. You know, he tried the carnivore diet. He tried sleeping on the floor instead of on a mattress and like studies these things. He'll do it for a month and make a documentary on it. He's a great guy. He's very talented. So anyways, he, he did a he did a very popular documentary um, and uh, some people were tagging me in it. And they're and they're like, hey, you should you should talk to Steven. You should do sunlight. And uh, I DM'd him and uh, we got together and we did a we did a long interview with me where kind of went through a lot of these questions from like a just the, the average questions that like your normal semi skeptical person who's been told by dermatologists their whole life that the sun is bad for you. You need to avoid it like you're going to get skin cancer, uh, blah, blah, blah. Stay inside. Um and just kind of that that entry point. And so what what we ended up making and what what Max ended up producing was, um, I think, an incredible entry level point for the average person, because this stuff goes really deep and it gets really technical. And that's not a bad thing. And some of the most fascinating stuff I've learned has been on the intricacies of how circadian biology works. I mean, pretty incredible. Um, but for the average person, they're going to kind of tune out and they're starting from a different point where they're just like very skeptical. It's like, why should I believe you when every doctor has told me the other thing? Yeah. So this documentary is 15 minutes and uh, it, it kind of goes through the arguments on both sides. It's very entertaining and I think is a great starting point to just 
open people's mind to the idea that they might be wrong and there's more to the sunlight story than maybe they've been educated on. Yes. And I love it because he includes sound bites from, I, I, is it a dermatologist in there? It is. The yeah. one who, it's my right? and she's one of these, you know, there's no such thing as safe sun. Yeah. Um, all the sun has UV radiation coming out of it. UVA radiation causes cancer. Therefore, you should never, ever go in the sun and you should wear sunscreen every waking moment, yeah. including indoors. Yep. <laughs> So she's in there and then so she, there's an interview with her and then there's an interview with you. <laughs> it's, the way he does it is very charming and funny. He's kind of gamified it. Yeah. There's the, I never get sun guy and the, I always get sun yeah. guy and he gets yeah, yeah, little yeah. points depending this on the thing. This whole thing is like, who will die first? He has these two yeah. characters, the guy that avoids the sun and the guy that's always in the sun. And he's like, I had a question, like, which of these people is going to die first? And uh, <laughs> it's, it's fun. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So, so let's respond to the dermatologist for a moment, because that is the message that we all, we've all been given. And I will, I will, you know, share my point of view with someone and they'll be like, "Uh uh-huh. And then they'll sit down in their beach chair and take out their (laughs) Neutrogena SPF 50 and put it all over their body. I get it. I get what, right? Because it's like, you're like, that's nice, Meredith. I don't want to get cancer. Yeah. So let's respond to that. Yeah. So let's start with, there are two types of studies on the effect of UV on human health. One is a cell study. And so what this means, you get a group of human cells, skin cells or otherwise in a lab, you take a UV light, you shine it on them. You observe what happens. What happens is bad. That's true. It, it, they get damaged by it. Why is that? Uh, so, so why don't I just believe that? Why don't I just believe, well, all the cells get damaged by UV light? End of the story. Many reasons. One, it's already an unnatural environment. You are not a clump of cells in a Petri dish. Two, the sun is not just UV light, right? The sun is a whole spectrum of light. One of which, two of which, or well, a slice of which, red and infrared, is actually restorative against the very kinds of damage, which UV has a ton of health benefits, right? But there's also this kind of damage component. But other parts of the sun spectrum actually restore. And so when they do these cell studies, they're modeling a scenario that doesn't exist in nature. The, the, the sun is not isolated UV light. And so showing that isolated UV light is bad does not, like prove it in the same way that like rice has arsenic in it. Like if I prove right. that arsenic is bad fruit for you, has sugar in it, but it's not, you're not I, eating I just the sugar, you're eating can't. the whole apple. <laughs> exactly. Right. So, so, so those studies are pretty flawed and you can also get into like, it's actually done under blue light, artificial lights in a lab. The blue light is also kind of phototoxic. It's amplifying it. There's no, anyways, I think the average person gets that. Like it's not super generalizable. Um, all you really have proved is that to a group of cells, UV on its own is a toxin. Okay, fine. There's really not too much you can do with that. And then the other type of study, which is better, but still has its problems, is population data. And so they'll look at surfers in Australia or higher UV countries or lower UV countries or populations that work outside versus work inside or the military. And they'll see like, what are the skin cancer rates? So these are more valid. There still are problems. I've already highlighted one of them. And one of those problems is that you're not controlling for circadian rhythm. But let's dig deeper into that. There's a concept in the literature called intermittent sun exposure. And basically, this refers to somebody, let's say, who works inside in an office in Manhattan Monday through Friday. And then on the weekend, they get a ton of sun that person would be considered having intermittent sun exposure. Whereas then you have someone who has consistent sun exposure, let's call it like someone that works outside, like all week, you know, they're, they're just outside every day. Um, intermittent sun exposure is a much higher risk than consistent sun exposure. Uh, so these population studies don't control for that. We also know for a fact that, yes, sunburns raise your skin cancer risk. 
don't get a sunburn. That's uh, it's literally a sign that your body has received more UV light than it can handle. Now, that's also kind of an interesting thing. I am a Fitzpatrick type two skin. If you don't know what that means, it means I have blue eyes, I have blonde hair, I have light skin, right? My ancestors are from Europe and Europe is a lower UV environment. Um, I live in South Florida. South Florida is a much higher UV environment than my genetic ancestors grew up in. However, I'm outside all day and I don't burn. Why is that? It's because I adapted gradually over a couple years by exposing my body to that environment. And now I, I haven't gotten a sunburn in years and I'm outside constantly. Am I laying on my back just baking there? No, I'd probably burn if I did that. But that's also kind of unnatural. I'm walking around, I'm doing things, and it's fine. So when you get consistent sun exposure, your body builds up a tolerance for it. It's used to it. It's something it manages, right? So these studies don't control for that. They don't control for circadian rhythm. And circadian rhythm directly influences how much damage you take because your DNA, your, your skin cells and other cells, they have kind of a, a repair cycle, right? Where during the night, they repair DNA damage. And during the day, they literally protect the DNA. They physically conceal it from light. But if your body thinks it's nighttime during the day, your DNA is exposed and it's being hit by UV radiation. So that makes so you a way yeah. that your body might think it's nighttime would be if you are, for example, wearing sunglasses. Correct. You have sunglasses on the beach. You were inside. You were inside all morning. Then you put on sunglasses. You went outside. You went to the beach. Your body has never gotten the right signals to be like, it's daytime. So you that literally can increase the amount of damage you're taking, right? So these studies don't control for any of that. Um, I think the audience starts to get the picture, right? So these are these are the flaws in the research. And I want to set that out because I'm going to just describe what it shows. But let's also be very clear, there are problems with the data. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. Now, what the data shows, even if we just take it at face value, and I don't kind of uh, try to argue any of it, is that there's a relatively verifiable connection that more sunlight uh, is going to increase, I believe it's squamous cell, uh, which is there's squamous cell, there's basal cell, and there's melanoma. Melanoma is like the really bad one. Squamous and basal cell are the things that like you go to the dermatologist and they're like, oh, yeah, we should probably freeze that off. Right. And generally you're done. Now, Sometimes it can be more complicated. I've had people reach out to me after I said this, like, well, I had this horrible squamous cell. Like, yes, it can happen. But when we're talking right. about like epidemiology, we have to talk about populations. And generally, this is pretty minor. Um, so right. so of the three types of, of skin cancer, those those first two are generally speaking, not a big deal. They're not those are the ones most linked to sun exposure. And then the melanoma is the one. That's the the bigger riskier, the riskier yeah. one. Okay, but so so squamous cell. Uh, there's a pretty verifiable, and I I may have basal cell and squamous cell flipped here, but basically, squa I think squamous cell. It's pretty clear sun increases it. Basal cell. It's like maybe maybe not. There's contradictory evidence. Those two might be flipped, but they're both the more minor ones. And then melanoma, which is the really bad one. Here's what's interesting. There's a lot of studies that show sunlight lowers it. Melanoma mostly appears on the parts of the body that don't see the sun. Uh, it goes up in indoor workers. It's skyrocketing in Northeast Asian countries that are the most sun phobic cultures. You, like a, they're a dermatologist's wet dream. Like no <laughs> one avoids the sun like Northeast Asian cultures, right? It's a, it's a status right. thing. Light skin is better and yeah. blah, blah, blah. Um, melanoma rates are skyrocketing. So there's a lot mm. of contradictory evidence that melanoma is actually caused by sunlight. And that's the bad one. So it's kind of like probably your risk of the minor ones goes up a bit. Your risk of the bad one goes down maybe quite substantially. And then the highest sunlight groups are much more likely to survive skin cancer, where the lowest sunlight groups are much more likely to die from skin cancer. And so this is the state of the research, not including any of the flaws that I pointed out. So I think if you accounted for those flaws, the data would even be more favorable towards 
sun's good rather than sun's bad. Right. So the overall benefits to our mental, physical, emotional, philosophical well-being are so increased by the sun that even if we do end up with one of these types of cancers, even especially the yeah. bad one, we are more likely to have the resilience to get through it than if we avoid the sun. 100%. And the other side of the story is you have like 50 to 60% reduced chances of pancreatic cancer, of breast cancer, colon cancer, thyroid cancer, stomach cancer, like all the, all the all right. Cancers, right. And that's a great point. Yes. Your risk for every other cancer goes yeah. way down. And those are the ones you don't want to get. You know, you don't yeah. want those. Like, do I really care if I'm 60 and I have to go get a thing frozen off once a year? Like, come on, what do you, which, which one are you going to pick? Like, especially if you get this, all of these other benefits, subjective well-being, blah, blah, blah. Like it's, it is the ones that increases somewhat reliably are the least that you need to worry about and all of the nasty stuff, it's going to improve both your chance of never getting it. And if you do get it, having it not be that bad. Right. So in a nutshell, we are really screwing ourselves over. We are minimizing our time spent outside. We are maximizing our time spent inside in front of toxic light. And when we do go outside, we're covering ourselves in, I mean, we didn't even talk about sunscreen being toxic, right? We are covering ourselves in a, a layer that is stopping yeah. the sun from giving us the health benefits that we could be getting. Yeah from I've, being outside. Oh, and, and I forgot to mention the other confound in the data. Is it just a graph of how many sunburns you got? Like you're saying more sun exposure. Okay. But what type of sun exposure, non-burning sun exposure or burning sun exposure? Right. There's a, there's a probability where the whole data set is just skewed by you're basically just charting the number of sunburns that a population got because sunburns will raise your skin cancer risk, right? Like we can be reasonable here. We can agree on some things like don't get a sunburn. Stop yeah. before you do. Yeah. Don't uh, get a sunburn and going outside in the morning, going outside periodically yeah. during the day over time, you become Built less up. likely to get a sunburn in the first yeah. place. Exactly. Exactly. So like there's a world where like the entirety of the population data is basically just confounded by you're really only measuring number of sunburns, not total sun exposure. And then it's, it's pretty much meaningless. The only thing you've proven is what we already knew, which is that sun's exposure increases skin cancer. Sun burning increases skin cancer rates. Right. Like, great. That's yeah. all you've shown. Um, so yeah, get safe sun, avoid the burn. Well, and it's interesting because I have two examples, uh, one in my, in my actual real life and one that I saw recently on Twitter. Um, there was, I don't know, the algorithm just showed me this cause it knew I would care. Right. There was a, uh, a post from a woman who has been religiously applying Neutrogena SPF something high, I forget to all over her face every single day of her life for the last 20 years. She just found, I forget which one, but she just found a cancer on her nose. Yep. Um, and she's linking it to the benzene in yep. the sunscreen, which officially isn't in there, but she says unofficially is in there. Yep. The second uh, example I have is someone who I know in my real life who grew up on the West Coast of Canada, which is like a beautiful, but not very sunny. She sure. never took tropical vacations. She never spends time outside. She doesn't swim. Yep. She had a melanoma found on her lower back, which I know for a fact hasn't seen the sun in seen the sun. probably since she was a child, right? So, exactly. and she's now in her 70s. So, yeah, it's like, what are we, what exactly are we uh, working with here? It's I'm, no longer makes sense. Exactly. And the thing you need to take away from that is as a, even if you're like a rational, skeptic, neutral observer, it is very clear there are non-sunlight induced skin cancer pathways. Unquestionable. There are other yeah. ways that this disease develops. And yeah. so I mean, I, yeah, like there has to be because otherwise, why are people getting it in places where the sun never hits? Yeah. Or, or like 
and, and yeah, yeah. Basically, so well, I people had, who never go in the sun in the first place, or who are always covered in sunscreen. Yeah, exactly. And like, if you're saying, oh, this minute amount of sunlight somehow That's made right. it, it's like no, you better live in a bubble, bro. Like, you're not gonna live. You're not living. Like it's, it's, it's an absurd conclusion. So I've talked with a guy who's a, who's a, who's a medical professional. He's, I would say he's kind of like neutral in between kind of skeptical, right? Like he's, he's not fully sold on some of this stuff, but he's also not like hardliner, like sunscreen inside guy. Uh, and what we were able to agree, and this is, this is, I think for, for the person that's on the fence, this is the really important conclusion. I had a good discussion with him and I was like, look, there is insufficient evidence. We just simply do not have it to make this conclusive, like, sun skin cancer, like, declaration. We actually don't know. There are three possibilities. One is that the sun causes skin cancer and, uh, like the results are like so bad and outweigh the benefits. I think that one is obviously extremely unlikely to be true Two, the sun causes skin cancer, but the, the cost is just minor relative to the, to the benefits. It just like, doesn't out, it doesn't weigh up at all. And so you want sun. And then three, there's actually some process of like, like adaptation where the more sun you get, you become real more resilient. And basically what we were able to agree on is that like looking solely at the sum literature on skin cancer, you don't know which of those three it is. You can't know. The data is not there. Even from the most hardline skeptical, you want to prove it. You can't prove it. We just do not have the right studies. All you've got is fucking cell cultures and weak population data. And so it's, you know, you've got to just, and the thing is, is like, so what, you're going to wait 30 years for that research to happen before you go outside, you've got to make a decision. And we do have very robust data on the benefits. Um, very, very robust. And, you know, you take some of these, you, you put this whole picture together that we've been talking about in this. Uh, and it, it just, it's very positive. Like if you have to take the chance, right? Like, I, I, I think it's just so heavily weighted that net, net, net more sun exposure is just going to be good for you outside of very rare cases. Yes. And the like great good news of that is that when, you know, we're inundated with all of this information and it's like just everything's coming at us and what should I do and not do and eat and not eat and take and not take and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I just go for a walk outside. And I make, and I'm getting healthier. I'm, I'm improving. I've, you know, it's like, I personally found that to be such a huge relief. Like it took such a weight off my shoulders, especially as a mom. I had, I was like, you know, trying to live my life in a way I was really into health stuff in my twenties. And then, you know, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to like be very middle of the road and not get too wrapped up in anything. And like, you know what? life was like, sorry, you're going to get chronic fatigue and your daughter's going to have food intolerances and this is going to happen and you're going to have to go down these rabbit holes. And it's, it's like overwhelming. Yeah. And when I, when I internalized the message that you're sharing here today, it was like, oh, I just go outside, put yeah. the children outside, walk around in my bare feet for a while when I can, like, and I'm making everything better. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's like, I think, I think, I think it's worth like, there's kind of two messages here. It's, it's maybe a spectrum, right? Like health is like excellence and illness are two ends of the health spectrum, right? Like, like, you know, like a real deficit in health is illness middle of the road. We call health. And then there's this other end that we like excellence or robustness or like vibrant, like, you know, like you're resilient. Uh, and I think that's all like a big spectrum. And so I think there's like two messages. I think for so many people, they, they, they hear this conversation for the first time because they have a health problem, like what you just described. They're like, there's something that's not working right in their life. Uh, there's a great quote. Um, it's by, it's by an old author, but it's, uh, um, a health, a healthy man never thinks of health, right? Like it's this thing, like you only consider health once you're ill or, or once you're facing some sort of challenge. Right. 
And so I think, I think that's an astute observation, but um, this isn't just something that you should do if you're dealing with health challenges. Like, do you want to be more effective at your work? Do you want to be a better parent? Do you want to have more energy to play with your kids? Do you want to like have like, you know, like whatever you're trying to do, it will be improved by this. And that's the other thing. It's like, yeah, you, you know, there are people that, you know, are forced to get into this because they're facing challenges, but everyone should be doing this. This isn't just something like, you know, like, oh, well, I'm fine. Like, yeah, but you could be better, you know? Yeah. And it's, and it's not hard. And that's, you know, I mean, cause I, I do, you know, I find people like, oh, what another thing to worry about. And it's like, no, less thing to worry about. Like now we know, yeah. now we know. Yeah. So I want to talk about, uh, you talked about doing 17,000 steps a day. So do you like take all your calls outside? Is that what you do? Or, like walk around? Yeah. Working? I do. I love yeah, this. I do. I do. So some, some of you actually get like 30,000. I walk a lot. I walk almost like all day and I do not have children yet. I look forward to having children, but I do not have them yet. So like, you know, grain of salt, like I'm a specific population that can walk for six hours a day. Um, but that's not saying one couldn't, you know, do that with, with children in some ways, right. You know, I mean, if you were Mongolian or yeah. whatever, like what, oh, we have know, lots of families walk. that are out in the forest like, every day. Yeah. People walk. <laughs> um, but anyways, I share that just to like, not get the yes. comments after this, like, Oh, it's easy for you to easy say. Easy for you like, to say. Yeah. Like, you That's know, okay. always the, the lead comment. I'm, yeah. You know, <laughs> no, no, no. people love to, people love to be like, Oh, well you can do it, but I couldn't do it. It's like, have you tried? Um, anyways, but I walk a lot. I have a lifestyle that's conducive to that. I have my, not just a remote job, but a job where a lot of my work is phone calls or work I can do off my cell phone. That's wonderful. I've optimized for that. But I, I yeah, that's what I do. I mean, I basically just, I, I walk all day. Um, I I love that. I, I think like, it's just, it's so essential, right? And yeah, I actually think like, there's a lot of conversation around like exercise, right? And look, like I go to the gym, I like lifting weights. I get a lot of, there's, there's a, some unique benefits out of that that you can't get from other stuff. And I love it. It's a pursuit that I, I like engaging in, but we conflate exercise and movement and they're different things. And like, even the concept of exercise is kind of a modern notion. We invented exercise when our technology progressed to where we stopped moving. Um, but we were, we were born to walk. Like there's something fundamental about it. Like if you look at the earliest brains, like in the, in the like small multicellular organisms, like you look at the first evidence of a brain developing, it does one thing and one thing only movement brains evolve to move. That is their base function. You need to move. Having a high level of movement, particularly outdoors, is way more important than going and like working up a sweat three times a week in a gym. They are not comparable. Exercise is the junk food of movement. It's not the same. You, you should first have a high level of movement where se sedentary, like it didn't exist in, in a large way. Like you can't be sitting for five hours a day, six hours a day, eight hours a day. Like you need to up that baseline level of movement, whatever that looks like. Again, it's a spectrum. You may have an office job, get up from your desk and take a five minute walk around the office. Like there are things yeah. to like every you, little, every little thing every, counts. It all counts, right? Like I'm take on, the, take the stairs up one level, come back down, like whatever. Like, yeah, Doesn't skip have the to elevator, be a huge thing. Yeah. park far away in the parking lot and walked like there are things. Um, I'm obviously on an extreme end of the spectrum. I walk constantly, but I, I love it. It's like, and so I have guys on my team, right? Like I run a, I run a kind of a sales motion in my company. I'm the head of that team. And so two, two, two of the guys on the team that joined recently, they bought um, treadmills under their desk. And so they just walk. And I love hearing from them because they're like, 
you know, honestly, like, I just feel like I'm so much better on the calls. I'm so much more engaged. I'm sharper when I'm moving. Right. And it's true. Like, you know, Steve Jobs, he would always make everyone do walking meetings. There's a ton of very high performers yeah. in the world that like walking was a part of the culture. That is so true. You're reminding me there's a fabulous movie. Um, I think you can only find it on YouTube. It was a film based on a play. It's called Copenhagen. And okay. it's about some of the early quantum physicists. And they're, they're, uh, anyway, I won't get into the details, but like they're having dinner and they're reminiscing about when they had breakthroughs. And yeah. every time they, they tell a story, they were walking in the woods. They would okay. get together and like hash out the details and then they'd be like, oh, we gotta go. It's time to go skiing. Yeah. It's time to go for, and it was when they were outside walking that they had all their breakthroughs. So many stories like that. Uh, you know, Steve Jobs, Einstein, Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, like um, uh, the guy that did Walden, uh, Emerson, uh, like just long yeah. odes to walking. It's essential. Like, and, and, and like, you know, you look at the health benefits of it. It's, it's far in excess of anything else. Now, part of it is usually people walk outside. So there's a kind of a confound there where some of what you're seeing is sunlight and some of what you're seeing is walking, but like the, the reduction in all cause mortality from someone like walking 16,000 steps. If you walked 16,000 steps a day, you would be better off smoke picking up a smoking habit than walking 8000 that's how big the all cause mortality reduction is across a population like you should you should you would rather start smoking than have an 8000 step per day reduction in your walking habit it's huge and wow. it's again like you can paint this very compelling picture from this like statistical data of health over a lifetime if that motivates you great I just feel so good. Like it's just, yeah. you get into a zone, <laughs> like you get into a mode. Yeah. It is a psychological state where it's a flow state. Like it's just, yeah. you're in action. Like everything quiets down. You're just doing. And, um, I, I, you know, the more you can optimize your life, I think I've never met somebody that picked up like a truly robust walking habit and was like, eh, yeah. it's okay. Really, yeah, it's, it's true. Never and just that. just the like the mental shift to being like, can I do this outside while I'm walking around? Like, oh, I have I have another call today. Like, oh, you know, like yes, there are there are certain zooms where you do probably sure, need to be course. at your desk, whatever. But like, if we even just little things here, like oh, well, this call I could do walking, or that call I could do walking. Exactly. Over time, those small choices make such a difference. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So the right decision isn't, let me think of all the things that I couldn't do walking. No, think of all the things. <laughs> you do. Like, sure. Yeah. There's calls I have to take here. Uh, you know, like I do an interview with CNBC or whatever. I have to be sitting. Right. And I do that. Right. There's some, <laughs> you know, some calls I even take inside. Right. But, but really you start to look at it and I mean, you know, like how many of just like it's an internal meeting with one other person that you know really well or like a client that loves you or like i mean there are calls there are calls you yeah. can take walking there are ways to do it and it's I a performance enhancer it is like you know you can make an argument there yeah and there's there's good motivation so yeah. so before we wrap i do want to talk a little bit uh about your day job all this, what you're doing while you're walking, uh, you work in Bitcoin. Yeah. So I think, you know, we were chatting before we started to record how, you know, having control over our environment and having control over where and how we work is such an important component to health now that we understand all these things. Yeah. Uh, so that sort of leads us into like the new economy, the new way of working, uh, the decentralized world. We're seeing yeah. so many changes happening right now. And yeah. I feel like a lot of us have one foot in, in the old in the old world and one of us in another foot in the new world. In this new world, my understanding is that like Bitcoin is going to be playing a very large role in a, a global currency that uh, is able to give people both freedom and security. Yeah. That would be about the limit of my understanding. Yeah. 
I did research it a few years ago and could say a little more, but I forgot it all now. So tell us what Bitcoin is for, yeah. for someone who's not familiar with it. Why should we know about it? Why should we care about it? And how does that, you know, like the thesis being that participating in this new world gives us more freedom to live the way we want yeah. to and be healthier. So it's funny. Sometimes it's like, uh, like the question of just like, why should I care about Bitcoin? It's almost one of the harder like questions to answer. I, I, I think I'll do an okay job at it, but um, there's just so much that goes into that. Um, so the first thing to understand, all money that you have ever used is freely issued by a government. Like that is the monetary standard of today and the last 50 years, right? So if you thought there's like a backing or there's some basis to it, or it's not just like points that's printed from thin air, that's not what it is. Every national currency, whether you're in Japan, Europe, America, Australia, South America, Africa, they are all just like, think of it just points, like spreadsheet points. Like you could say, if you imagine that the government had a big Excel spreadsheet and they just put numbers into it, that's not a far off understanding from what's happening. This is historically anomalous, right? That is not descriptive of money throughout human civilization. Money for most of human civilization had some sort of backing, right? It was gold or it was seashells or there was, it could not just be created from thin air. Um, now, physical money in that way had some problems. There's a reason it transitioned to this, uh, we call it fiat currency. Um, but you know, it was gold for a while, right? Why was it gold? Because gold was scarce. It was hard to fake. It was costly to produce. Uh, and those are good qualities in money because if money's easy to produce, then you just produce money and you don't produce goods. Everyone's a counterfeiter, right? And nobody yeah. builds and, anything. And so then it has no value. And it has no value, right? So like, right. Okay. it's good that money's hard to produce, hard to fake. It's costly. That's actually a positive trait for money not for technology or goods, but it's good for money. Uh, you want scarcity in money and abundance in goods. Um, but, but there's a reason gold failed. I'm not a gold bug. And gold failed for a very specific and legitimate reason. And the reason is because it was so hard to transact with and transport, right? You're not going to pay for a cup of coffee with a gold coin or if you're going to shave off a little piece. Like, no. Um, and so it was inevitable that what would happen is people would deposit the gold with a bank and the bank would issue a paper receipt that this represents 0.1 units of gold, right? Inevitable. That was always going to happen. And that was good that that happened in many ways. It let the economy grow. It let civilizations trade easier, but it had one fatal flaw. And it was that the they issued more receipts than there was gold. It was uh, the re it's called rehypothecation. And like you have a hundred units of gold, but there's no accountability. So you issue a thousand units of receipts, right? Um, anyway, so that was the problem with gold. Eventually, they basically do away with the collateral altogether. They say, if we're just issuing these things from thin air without any backing, what if there just was no backing? Let's just completely abstract it. Let's just, you know, first, one unit of gold, one unit of paper, then one unit of gold, unlimited units of paper because nobody cares, nobody ever redeems it. And then it's like, well, why the, why the hell is gold even involved? Let's just f fucking get rid of it. Um, and so we get to the modern system of today, which is all money is created from thin air and trades freely against each other. Um, so why is that bad, right? That may sound kind of unintuitive, that may sound kind of weird, but that isn't the same as me proving that that's bad. So why is that bad? The reason is because we all saw how the government managed COVID. I think most people would agree it was managed very poorly, right? It, it, was, it was kind of unintelligent. It, was, it, was, it didn't have a lot of finesse. All they had were these very blunt instruments like, uh, I guess we're going to lock down the entire country. Now, I'm not trying to get political with this. I'm just trying to make a point that whether or not, whatever you think about COVID, the government's response was a blunt force weapon. They did not have a more fine-tuned weapon. And this is emblematic. And this is an example of something with monetary policy. The reason this is bad is because the information which is available to a government will always be orders of magnitude less 
than the total sum of information which is available to the market. Now, when I say the market, some people be like, this is like economic theory or something. All the market means is people, literally just people, everybody, everybody in the country. That's the market. The market is just made of people. And so what it's saying is that people, real people, boots on the ground, have more information than the government can have. For example, Meredith, you know more about quant about circadian biology than the government knows about circadian biology. If the government had to make policy choices about circadian biology, it would probably be much less effective at doing it than you are, right? Especially, not just you, but everybody like you, all of the people that know anything about it would be much more competent, right? There is a reduction of information. And so the reason this applies, the reason I'm telling this analogy is that when the government manages money from the top down, money's like this coordination tool. It's like uh, it's, it, it allows communication to happen in an economic system. It actually conveys information. Prices convey information like they're not arbitrary. When you go into the grocery store and you see that a banana has gone up in price, you might not know why that is, but it represents something real. It, their banana farms had a tough year. There was a drought in South America. There was X, Y, or Z, right? It has real embodied condensed information. And that price actually condenses all of this stuff, which you could never know. How much fertilizer did that farm have? Was there a drought? What were weather patterns? Did trade costs increase, shipping costs, fuel costs? It simplifies it all into one number. However, there's a problem. And the problem is that when the government prints currency from thin air, you now don't know. Was that price increase because there was a real boots on the ground difference in the production of bananas? Or is it because of inflation? Or is it just because the government printed more money? It is now de facto impossible to answer that question. And so every entrepreneur and every person and every consumer and everyone all over the world, they now just look at prices going up and it's like, uh, maybe it's inflation. So nothing maybe... means anything anymore. Nothing means anything. A number anything. that used to be able to convey a certain type of information is now meaningless. Yes. And so what happens is it produces something called capital misallocation. And so when the market, people, entrepreneurs can no longer discern accurately through price signals what's going on, they take their scarce resources. I have a million dollars to invest in growing my business. I don't have 10 million. I can't print 10 million. I can't print money. I have only this $1 million and I need to build a company with it. I'm now making less informed decisions. It is now harder for me to take that money and build something real, do actually do something because all of the data is skewed by this hidden, invisible inflation monetary debasement element. And so it's, it impairs everybody in this way from accurate decision making. And then there's this added component that is also capital misallocation because the government has unlimited money in this sense. They can just shoot money at whatever they want. They do stupid shit with it. They do <laughs> ineffective shit with it. And when I say no. stupid, I don't, mean, I don't mean policies that Stephen Lupka disagrees with. I mean spending $20,000 on a cup for the military, right? They're, they're, right. That's, that's a dramatic example. but. They do it in ineffective, inefficient ways because they they just can't be efficient, right? Like this is what we learned in the Cold War. This should not be controversial. The Soviet Union tried to centrally plan the economy. America did not. What happened? They were like bread lines over in the Soviet Union because the small group of the Politburo, of the bureaucrats, they couldn't manage how much bread needs to go here and where we should produce more corn and where we need more nails. Because again, there's an information loss. And so this shouldn't be controversial. This was proven by real world history that the government cannot make economic decisions as efficiently as the market. But what happens is when they have a monopoly on printing currency, 
That's what we give them the power to do. We give them an unlimited spending authority uh, and it just distorts the whole system. And yes, this impacts people's wealth. It, you, you know, you deal with inflation, you're poor, blah, blah, blah. Like, OK, we all get that's bad. But actually, the biggest sin of this system is that it slows down the total sum progress of the human race. We literally progress more slowly because the entire architecture of everything has been impaired. Technology progress slows down. The innovation slows down. It all, and that's without even getting into like, that there are then cultural incentives and political incentives and people get paid and money influences yeah. things. And it increase in bureaucracy. Story. So I'll, I'll, I'll pause there on kind of the, the, okay. the kind of economics lesson. But so Bitcoin is an alternative to all that. Uh, and I spent a lot of time talking about the current system. Um, I, I, I don't want to turn this into a Bitcoin podcast. The thing you need to understand Nobody can issue more Bitcoin. You cannot create more. No government, no company, no group of developers, not the Bitcoin miners. It's just simply there is a fixed amount of Bitcoin and the system goes with it. So if you want to opt out of this kind of fiat monetary system that uh, I think has these flaws, uh, well, Bitcoin is an alternative. And for those of us in the industry, we believe that uh, a world in which Bitcoin played a much larger role in global finance would be a better world. Interesting. So if it's limited, um, help me understand how people can participate on a mass scale without yeah. diluting the currency. So it's super subdivisible, right? Like you don't need to buy one Bitcoin. You can buy 0. 0.000001 Bitcoin. Right. So okay. it's there's enough units for everybody. It doesn't have a constraint there. You can acquire it. You can do whatever with it. Um, it's just it's super subdivisible. OK, so but, in the same way that spending more time in the sun is it's giving us a hedge against a lot of different diseases and optimizing our current experience, yeah. would you say Bitcoin is offering a similar yeah, I love that. Upside. A lot of, yeah, and a lot of people describe Bitcoin as a hedge and like, you know, we could talk about this for hours. There's um Yeah, listen, the, I just threw that word out on No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> I have no commitment to it. The so if there's a better way to, to articulate it, please. No, it's a great no, it's a great phrase. That wasn't a critique okay. of the phrase. It was just saying there's this whole other pathway. The interest on the government debt is about to exceed like social security obligations. It's, it's going into the trillions of dollars every year. And so there's this other world, like another reason people own Bitcoin is because they believe the federal debt situation is unsustainable and Bitcoin's a way to protect from that. So there's that whole story. There's really like, you know, people are using to, it to develop infrastructure all across the world. Bitcoin mining has electrified uh, African villages. It consumes excess power. It, it produces, you know, economic prosperity. I mean, there's, there's just there's so much to the story. It's really deep. Um, but, you know, my if you're watching this, like I can't do it justice, but you should look into it. You should learn more for yourself. Would would you suggest a resource for the person who's like, hmm, I don't own any Bitcoin, but maybe I would like to? Yeah. Now, so now what do I do? Well, that's Swamp, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna okay. show my own business here. Do but, it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But so I work for a company, Swan Bitcoin. If you're interested in this, go to our YouTube channel. There's just a ton of free stuff. Like you don't have to pay a cent. You don't have to do anything. Learn about. Just learn. Just learn. Just learn more. I run the private client team. So if you're looking for someone to hold your hand, I mean, I'll get on a phone call with you and we'll walk through it. If you're looking to buy, you know, like, like a decent chunk of it. Um, if you know, but we, we serve clients of any size, you can get okay. a personalized support. There's a ton of free information on the so you YouTube. You could like open a little account on Swan and, and buy a hundred dollars yeah. worth of Bitcoin. It's like a brokerage account. If you can open okay. a Fidelity account, you can open a Swan account. If you can buy stocks in a Fidelity account, you can buy Bitcoin on Swan. It's don't, don't be intimidated by it. You don't need to be a hacker. It's literally like opening a brokerage account. Whew, that's a relief. I like that. Yeah. Um, 
Stephen, thank you so much. I yeah. love, you know, this has just been such a fun conversation. And, you know, what I really, I love that I, when I hear from people so much is that they listen to people like you talk and they just, they feel a little bit more excited about life than they did before. And but, you really, really brought that energy today. So I appreciate it so much. Well, Thanks for I being here. I borrowed that energy from the sun. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So it is available to all of us. Yes. We just need to step outside. Such a, such a pleasure, Stephen. Thank you. Absolutely. This was great. Thank you for having me on. And uh, I'm also, I'm on Twitter. So Stephen Loop on Twitter. Oh My yeah, we can. Okay. So Swan Bitcoin and yeah. at Stephen Lupka at Twitter, we will also make no, sure. No, the ad is totally different. You're not going to be able to oh. pronounce it, but just search Steven Lupka and I will come up. The the ad okay. is Zambala Hodl. <laughs> story. Of course it is. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. we'll just we'll just put that in the show notes along with your name so people yeah. can find you. You are you're a great time on Twitter. I enjoy your feed very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Woohoo! You made it to the end of another episode. Thank you so much for joining us on this exploratory adventure into new realms. Your energy and support are building a different world, and I am so grateful to be on this journey with you. Take care and thanks.